Welcome to Grappling with the Gray, a forum for promoting an ethical mindset and ethical decision making. Help us more clearly see both sides of complex issues and better navigate the moral challenges of everyday life. I'm Rabbi Jonathan Goldson, and I'd like to welcome my guests for today. With me is Mark Hirschberg, who is Chief Technology Officer and Chief Product Officer at Zerio.ai. He is a professional speaker and creator of Brain Bump a free app that helps consumers of nonfiction content better access and retain what they learn. Sven Lauch comes to us from Plymouth, England. He is director of Eyes Up Training Limited, which offers a holistic approach to implementing organizational change with emphasis on developing transferable skills that anyone can learn. And Stuart Wiggins joins us from Southern France. He is chief advisor at Induna Advisors, working to significantly increase company revenue by developing positive client reports and establishing solid business relationships. Thank you all for being with me today. You're welcome. And here is our topic. Late last year, a senior German policeman was convicted of threatening a suspect with torture to extract information about the whereabouts of an abducted boy. Wolfgang Dauscher, Dauschner, Dauschner. Am I saying that right, Sven? Hope so. Probably. That was not. He received a warning instead of jail time in addition to a fine of about $18,000. Although many Germans sided with Dauschner for choosing the lesser of two evils, the presiding judge, Barbel Stock, said that, quote, respect for human rights is a foundation of our constitutional state. Information cannot be forced from someone even if one is seeking to avert danger, unquote. Amnesty International welcomed the verdict, saying it upheld an, an absolute ban on the use of torture, and Germany's police union said the ruling was understandable. The case has particular resonance in Germany, where the Gestapo and the Stasi routinely trampled on detainees' rights during the Third Reich and under Soviet-style government. Dasha's defense was partly based on his view that at the time that the abducted that at the time the abducted boy might still have been alive, and that the suspect had to be made to talk to find the victim. Tragically, the suspect had already murdered the boy, although he did lead the police to the body. The police's interrogation tactics, once they came to light, threatened to derail the trial, although ultimately the defendant was sentenced to life in prison. Whether torture is excusable to exact information that might save lives has been a particularly hot topic of debate, especially since 9-11. But what are the ethical angles involved in the threat of torture? The floor is open. Well, I put a lot of thought into this. And you usually do, Stuart. Well, <laughs> I to me anyway, I think that I have to dis I have to determine what torture really is, and this is just from my perspective. And the way the way I compartmentalize it is, is torture where you take someone to a threshold emotionally, physically, mentally, where they almost break, or is it the threat of some sort of crossing some threshold as we have here, or? Is it not where you can just take them to the edge? For example, if you put somebody in a room at 30 degrees for 24 hours, that's tolerable to almost every human being, but is that torture? So I think you have to define, and I guess anyone who's in the business of extracting information has to define what torture is to decide whether they are crossing a line. So you could argue in this particular case, this police officer thought that the threat of it was okay, but culturally, obviously in Germany, it touches a, it's a touch point and the authorities didn't agree with the police officer. I just tossed that out to the group, but that was my thinking when I went into this. Well, you're raising a really interesting point there, Stuart. If psychological torture is also torture, then maybe the threat of torture is also torture. I'm going to go uh, take another step in that torture is perhaps relative. If you think about some things like sleep deprivation. Now, when I was at MIT, I regularly pulled all-nighters 
and going 48 hours without sleep was not unheard of. And I know people who went even further, but there are people, especially those with sleep disorders, for whom that is a serious risk to them. Certainly it puts a lot more strain. If we take a more extreme example, you could put me in a room where things are disorienting or you could take away comforts from me and I'll probably be okay, maybe not happy about it. But if you take someone very far out on the autism spectrum or with severe OCD, that is significantly more painful. And we can even get the physical equivalent that certain things that hurt some people, maybe a little discomfort become very discomforting to others. Is there a line? Is torture relative or is it absolute? And we have to recognize you can't always tell. We can't tell, well, how much does this bother you versus the next person? You kind of think, remind me of the discussion about pornography. Um, the Supreme Court said, I know when I see it, maybe torture is uh, not quite like that. Sven, any thoughts? Well, kind of, there, there's so many things that come to mind for me, um, even just on the definition of torture, which just, you know, I'm just going to add a, a little bit to this. So, you know, as I said, I come from East Germany. My parents were under the Stasi surveillance. Um, and one of the things that were threatened was that they would take the children away if they would talk about my granddad's story. Um, I don't want to go there. But here's my question. Is that torture? To threaten them to take the children away, which basically meant that my parents began to make decisions in order to keep us as a family together, which in respect had an impact on me because I grew up in a lie. And it's so for me, it's already a question, you know, it's not even physical. It's just literally a manipulative boundary setting of if you do this, we're going to do this. So that's for me a question already. Is that torture? I guess in day-to-day -day life, though, Sven, there are situations that take place where you make decisions because you think the outcome may be negative. And... I don't think that anybody could argue that that's torture. That just means that in your decision-making cycle, you've decided that the outcome is negative uh, just based on what, what someone said. Um, I don't disagree with what you're saying, but it, again, as I think about this, it's almost as though torture really is based on how the individual perceives it at that given time. So in your case, that would be torture. In someone else's case, they may approach it differently. But you bring a different set of circumstances into it, so that's why you approach it that way. Let me give you an alternative. You're a single parent, and you're told if you ever get caught driving drunk, you're going to go to jail, and we're going to take your children away and put them in the foster system. That is the same consequence. You're going to lose your children. But most of us would say, well, that's not torture. That is a reasonable rule we want for society. And so it becomes a question of at what point is this rule justified? Do we say this is where we draw the line for balance versus this is too far? To take an example from today, I believe it's El Salvador. I might be getting the country wrong, but I think in El Salvador, they had a severe gang problem. Literally, people were getting killed just walking to the supermarket every day. It was just, there was no government. There were just little gang controlled sections. And a new president came in a few years ago, cracked down on the gangs. For many residents, they say, this is great. We love this because we feel safe. I can go out of the house. I don't worry about getting shot on my way to the supermarket. But critics have said, well, you did so by locking people up without trials, without really a chance for justice. And so, yes, you caught bad guys. You probably caught some good guys. And so that's a question of where do we draw the line? We've said in the U.S., a hundred guilty men should go free before one innocent man goes to jail. That unfortunately doesn't quite happen. And so it's where's the line that is okay, that is ethical versus going too far, and that's a more general question of which torture is one example. Yeah, in the case so, that you came up with, Mark, about um, you know, the, the the driver, the single parent, you know, there you can make a, a coherent case 
that we're protecting the best interests of the children by trying to provide them a safe environment uh, and a responsible parent. Um, at some point, that becomes more of a judgment call, depending on exactly what the elements are. You could argue under certain authoritarian governments, if you tell this story, we <laughs> see it as a threat to the government and it will corrupt their minds. Now, most of us would probably disagree with that. There are probably people out there. We certainly see in the U.S. people saying we have to ban these books because they will corrupt our children. So we do see people saying this is a threat to children and we have to engage this other threat to take them away, believing it's in their best interest. And it opens up the broader question of are we evaluating things from a utilitarian standpoint, a deontological standpoint, or a virtue ethics standpoint? Because we could all take different points of view and come to different outcomes, different conclusions based on that approach or school of thought. And I think that's an important thing to do, uh, to even hold the tension between all of them. Um, I, I learned about compassion. And for me, compassion means I'm not against justice. I'm actually outside the justice continuum between the victim and the offender. I'm actually stepping off that and see both people as people. That doesn't mean I'm not, I'm against justice. I'm certainly not against justice. I want to let justice do its cause, but I can still see both as humans with backstories and with their own challenges, you know, that, that come with that injustice. And I think that that is a big challenge. And, and in a case like the one that John, Jonathan shared with us, I think that that is one of the biggest challenges is like, where do we where do we focus on? Do we focus on the person, the offender, and say like, well, this is unjust and he needs to talk? You know, then I think like, well, there's a point to save a child. You know, however, why does this person do this in the first place? What's the backstory? That's for me where the compassion comes in. It's like, hey, wait a minute, he's a human too. He doesn't do this because of he wanted to do this. There's a story how he ended up there. And so that's for me the big challenge in the discussion is is really the justice continuum, but also kind of like where do we start and end of saving lives and not? Yeah, I and mean, you've really uh, touched on uh, one of the foundational principles in in Jewish philosophy, Sven, that uh, we do see compassion as a higher form of justice, taking all factors into account. But you know, from Scripture, you have this concept of justice is blind which means that for a society to function pragmatically, or as you say, Mark, in a utilitarian sense, we can't take all of these factors into account. The, 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 the legal system cannot be aspiring to that higher form of, of justice that we call compassion because there are simply too many variables that are outside our control, and that would lead to anarchy. So we have to limit our view to the hard facts in front of us in order to have a legal system that works. And yet we have to retain a sense of compassion and compassion and understand that, that uh, you know, the issues really transcend the immediate, the immediate facts. And then that, that can be an awfully difficult uh, balancing act. So let me ask this to the group then. We talk about compassion. <clears throat> your spouse or one of your kids, they get kidnapped, and you know that you've become aware of the fact that they only have two hours left to live. And you, it's a short timeline. You find the person who did the kidnapping, and is it is it uncompassionate to try to find out what their threshold is? You have a loved one. See, we're in this nice little room here and there's four of us sitting here and we're chatting. But if it's real world and you have to do whatever you can to save a loved one, then how does that threshold change for you to save the person that you're after? Because that's really what it boils down to. What we're willing to do at any given point. I'm not advocating one thing or another, but if you're in a situation where you have to do something and it's just you, where does that compassion come in? Well, when you say real world, um, you know, this has been going on in Israel for the last 
year now. Uh, and, you know, I have a daughter who lives in Israel. Uh, my, my son was friends with one of the one of the six that was just murdered uh, a couple of weeks ago. And and this is a very real conversation going on. Uh, you know, there's increased demand to release the hostages. But the last time uh, to make a deal to get the hostage release, but the last time they released prisoners, well, one of those prisoners released was the mastermind of this whole operation. Uh, there is no clear answer to these kinds of questions. Uh, there was a very powerful comment that someone made early on uh, that if I were the parent of a hostage, I would demand that the government do anything possible to get back my child. And I would hope that the government would not listen to me. Mm. Yeah, and I thought that was a very powerful expression of how we have these two competing values. You know, and, and that's what ethical challenges are about. Uh, there's no way to 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 win. <laughs> that you can, There's no win-win here. When you talk about the practicality of it in your example, there's two important assumptions that you've made that I think we need to really make explicit because I don't know if those assumptions hold. The first is that torture actually works. And we know the CIA report has said, no, it tends not to. So torturing the person might make you feel better. And in some cases, maybe it does work, but it's not clear it really would. So there's the practicality of it. And there are those who argue all torture does is it gets you or it gets the person being tortured to just spit out whatever they need to say to make it stop. So it's not helpful to you. But now there's a second point you said you've got the person who kidnapped your child. Who who knows that for sure? How many times in history, in U.S. history, have we said, oh, that's the criminal, that's the bad guy? And especially in U.S. history, where we've looked at minorities and said, well, obviously, he's the bad guy. And how many of them have been tortured in the back of police cars or uh, other police facilities or jails or elsewhere because we knew that person was guilty. And so this was justified, but we were wrong. In fact, there's even a larger question. We talked about on the scale of justice, how you balance between the two, but who gets to meddle out that justice? We do not allow vigilantism. We have courts. And when you have that suspect who has not gone through due process, who has not yet been found guilty, well, there's a clock ticking. At what point do you say, hey, you in the field get to make the decision of if this person is guilty? We allow exigent circumstances for things like, I'm going to violate the Fourth Amendment. The police can kick down the door and go into the home if they hear screams. And yes, you're violating someone's right, but that's not a major violation. And if it turns out they're wrong to do so, the courts can say, well, what you saw doesn't count. But once you've tortured someone, you can't take that back. You can't say no, it doesn't count. So do we get to determine before the court does whether someone is guilty or not? And how do we know if we're right? Let me ask you something, Mark. Why do, why do we love vigilante movies? Because I think it makes us feel, because in the vigilante movies, for the most part, they're not wrong. They do <laughs> go out and get the bad guys. And in a world where we don't always see justice, Yay, someone did something. When you think back to like the 1970s with Dirty Harry and uh, the Charles Bronson movies, especially when crime rates were high, mm -hmm. people really wanted to see that because they felt that the courts were failing them. It's interesting that you bring up movies. You know, Germans have a really crime, crime, crime kind of culture in, in even public TV. So we have like series that are like 40 years old and still running. And very successful. Um, and my wife, you know, when I shared with her our topic, she said, like, that's very interesting in those movies. They can just back and bang people's heads, you know, against the table or just take them and push them against the wall and get an answer out of them. And then the story moves on. But it doesn't work like that in the real world. And that, that's, I think, one of those challenges. Um, and another thing, there was a quote because, Mark, you just mentioned guilt. Um, and it rem reminded me. Uh, of a quote from Jenny's Webb. She wrote a book called Running on Empty. It's about childish emotional neglect. And one of the things she speaks about is guilt. And how she defines guilt was something that really touched me. And it was like, guilt 
is meant to stop us from unnecessarily harming or violating others. It is not meant to stop us from protecting ourselves. I mean, you do have groups that are extreme pacifists that will not raise their hand even in their own defense. And, you know, intuitively, I think many of us have trouble buying into that. Um, certainly in Jewish law, it's explicit that self-defense is entirely justified. But it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's worth reflecting upon that philosophy, uh, at, least in, in, at least in a theoretical sense, the unwillingness to do harm on it for any reason. Let's take that further. Certainly, if someone's coming at me with a knife, yes, I can use potentially lethal force to save myself. What if that person has said, I am going to go kill you, announces it on social media, then goes into a gun store to get a gun, and we'll ignore issues of waiting periods, like let's say gun show loophole. Can I use lethal, lethal force at that point? They haven't pointed the gun at me. They haven't even loaded the gun, but they have announced an intention. And so now they are taking a first step. Now, we know they could at some point turn around and say, wait, what am I doing? So where is it okay for me to do that? Now, I gave, obviously, there's a contrived example, but we see, for example, with terrorists, with Middle East and elsewhere, where people say, yes, I want to destroy these other people, this other country. So at what point do you say, well, it's fair game. They are in the theater of operations. They haven't picked up the gun yet, but they're trying. Do I have the right to use lethal force or use torture or use other methods because they're on the board and fair game as an active combatant, even if not at that exact second. It raises for me an even deeper question. Um, if we take lethal force to you know, stop this from happening before it even happened, do we actually stop being able to believe that change is possible and that a person might actually completely change? Even later on, after they did the deed, could it be that they become a really influential, positive, life-changing person that makes our society better if we would keep them alive in the first place? And so, so you know, where for me, from a Christian perspective, the the whole idea of grace and the potential of salvation, you know, also plays a role. It's like you know, it's like, yes, I could now do something, but if I go too far. Maybe I rob the world from actually having a really positive influence because there is a potential of maybe change. Maybe not. I don't know. See, this is why I made the comment at the outset about what is torture. I mean, because, again, I'll ask the question. If I make somebody really uncomfortable, not physically hurt them, but if I make them uncomfortable, is that torture? Like I said, the example I use is I put them in a 30 degree room for 24 hours. They're fully closed, but is clothed. But is that torture? Because we've taken it from, we've taken to the extreme of what we would do to this person to hurt them, kill them, do something to them. But the, the whole thing boils down to where do you draw the line before it becomes torture? Is it discomfort? Is it the threat of discomfort? And because there are lots of things you can do. I mean, in my military expensive experience, I did prison camp training. And I've taken people, stripped them down naked and put them on a block of ice and made them sit there for training. Is that torture? I mean, I didn't hurt anybody. They survived it. I might have made some people cry. But that was to prepare them for what really could happen in a real world situation. So that's why I say, you know, our bias and our ethics keep us from keep us from crossing that line. But what is that line? Well, I think maybe if we can try to bring it back to the original question a little bit more, because you know we've been wandering far 
far afield that if we take something like stripping somebody and putting them in a, in a refrigerated room or waterboarding or things that are clearly worse than that, um, I think most of us would would say there's a at least an intuitive difference between doing that and threatening that. Now, we've, we've been discussing this idea of psychological, inflicting psychological pain could be a form of torture. And yet I still think that, again, intuitively at least, we'd say the line could be somewhere between those two. And so even if, based on principle, we don't want to torture whatever the definition of torture is, is the threat of torture fundamentally different and if it is, is it different enough to justify what this policeman did in this case? If people know that torture is nothing more than just a threat, if it's one that can't be executed, if I knew there's no waterboarding, let's say the U.S. passed a law and I knew the people interrogating me were following it, they said, well, tell us or we're going to waterboard you. I could sit there comfortably and think, no, you're not. And the threat has lost all meaning. Threats only work when they are credible. And to be credible, it has to be executed at some point. I mean, John McCain said it. Torture doesn't work. I think we all agree with that. But where's, where's the point that some something can be effective. Look, there are no drugs that can make somebody talk. Right? You know, I looked for days trying to see if there was any type of drug that could be used in lieu of torture. There is no drug to make people talk. So how do you make somebody talk? The threat of it, you've already said it, Mark. Is, is the threat going to work if you don't know it's not, it's not going to be followed through? That's not going to work. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to get, you have to solve a problem. If you're an interrogator, you have to solve the problem. You know you can't torture, or at least physically, and even take mentally to a certain point. What do you do? I mean, that's what this whole gray area thing is. Well, I think in this case, though, is it's really a threat of vigilantism. <laughs> this policeman is saying, I'm going to disregard the rules when it comes to you, to get you to talk. So that that does restore perhaps the the effectiveness of the threat. You know, and, and also, you go ahead. And, and I think it's not just you know the the, the threat in itself, um, because I think the threat is not a threat if there isn't something that you would follow through with it. So. That that's definitely true, and in in this case, I think in Germany, it, you know, there is no that that's definitely banned and has been banned before. That was not a new thing in that sense. Um, the question I think that they had legally was: is the threat already breaking the rule? That I think was basically what the case in the end had to had to negotiate was: is the threat in itself enough mm -hmm. to be illegal? Um, and and that's kind of you know where where that question is. It's like if somebody really willing to, to break the law, and in his case, you know, I can totally see and understand the idea of the threat of even threatening with I'm breaking the rules. I know what I what I'm going to do is going to break the rules to make it credible. Doesn't mean that he would actually do that. Okay, it might just really try to emphasize the threat. Um, but actually the threat might be the reason the guilt that I read before is like to stop us from unnecessarily harming someone. So the threat might actually be the sign of guilt. I don't want to harm you. I'm just threatening you, but I, I want an answer. Because so, otherwise I you know, skip the threat, threat and I just go straight to the torture. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a, it's a very interesting conversation. And in his case, I think he believed that the boy was still alive. So that there's another kind of, for me, a, another dynamic to the story where this justice continuum and also kind of 
idea of saving someone's life plays a role that doesn't reject the idea of restorative justice on the side of the offender to possibly help him to change and you know it's it's not it's not a death sentence in that sense either so i think that there are loads of of things also in that story that you know he was convicted for threatening he wasn't convicted for actually doing it So he kept his morality in place. He kept his morality in place. He didn't hurt the person. He made the threat. You know, whatever bias he may have had, he kept it in place. I mean, I'll, I'll ask you a question. If he took it one step further, what if he told somebody to go in another room and scream? And he told the person that you hear that noise over there? That's another person that we have. And that could happen to you. Is that torture? Or is that just a ruse? There's the old movie trope right before they torture someone where they lay out the instruments where they make it seem more real. So where, where's the line? Is it just saying, I'm going to do this to you? Is it putting the knife to them, not cutting their skin, but saying, guess what I'm going to be doing? That That's a really good question. Where is that line? And it may be the potter of I'll know it where I, when I see it. Well, that's what they did to Galileo. Yeah. What what was it? I know he was confined. What specifically did they do? He was he him? was um, you know he came up with this this whole model of the universe that they didn't like, and uh, so they they brought him down to the torture chamber and said, uh, you know, this this is what's waiting for you, and that was enough for him. <laughs> he recanted. <laughs> now, so take was... that. Was that torture? Would you define that as torture? Well, you well. Could... Here's a question. What is hard? Because, that? and here's what is hard. So what is what does it mean to be hard? Is it not only physical? And that I think is also why the justice system in Germany so had another question, you know, where that's quite a question of this torture starts. Does the torture start the moment you threaten? Because, because the, otherwise, it wouldn't be, is it, is otherwise that, it's the threat of torture, psychological torture. Yeah. So because otherwise there wouldn't have been a legal case. There, if there wasn't something that they could say like this was really hurting or painful or injustice as an act towards the person. So there must have been an act that they would actually legally have to talk about. And even so in the that, judge's that, decision. So, Right. It says respect for human rights is a foundation of our constitutional state. Information cannot be forced from someone, even if one is seeking to avert danger, which implies the evaluation of what this officer did as torture. Yeah. So does that mean as soon as he walked in the interrogation room, that could be defined as torture? Because as soon as you start asking questions, and if they're hard questions based on that definition, you could say that was torture. But you said implied was was one of the words in the uh, in the statement. Right? Um, I think implied was the word I used. Um, respect for human rights is a foundation of our constitutional state. Information cannot be forced from someone, even if one is seeking to avert danger. Unquote. And so here's here's a subtle variant on I'm going to do this to you. You gave the example of. You put someone in the next room, you have them scream, you do the old Milgram experiment and say, that's going to be you next. Does it make a difference if you don't say that line? I remember an episode of Burn Notice. I was a big fan of the show. And so the main character, they had caught this Russian mob guy. And the main character went undercover as a prisoner and was, oh, they keep beating me and torturing me and you know, trying to get me a talk. Not that they did something to the other guy, but the implied threat was there. No one said, do it or we're going to hurt you. So does it have to be explicit? Can you walk them halfway there and let their mind take the last few steps? And is that the same as if you directly threatened them? I don't think you crossed the line there. I really don't. I think that 
person's going to think what the, if, if you're the person they're trying to get information from them, you're going to think what you want to think. And if you bring that person in to say, this is, this is what they did to me. All I'm, all that person did was express something. If that person takes it farther and says, Ooh, that could happen to me. And they make a decision based on that. That's not torture. See, I, I get back to the, I get back to my original question. What is torture? You know, I mean, I think we agree that it, it could be physical pain to a certain degree. It could be emotional pain to a certain degree. But that's why I said earlier, as soon as you start the interrogation and asking questions, is that torture? Because if someone takes those questions pejoratively, then they could say it was a form of torture. Of course, on the I flip know, side, I, you I could do. you could ask, um, does the does the motive for extracting information have anything to do with it? You know, here this was a case of a, a child's life. What if it's a larger number of people? What if it's a, a nuclear bomb in in a world capital? Uh, does that matter, or is the principle just supposed to work across the board? That was the question posed in the 2016 presidential debate. It was asked of Hillary Clinton. It was a question actually passed to the uh, moderators by Bill Clinton. And I think that goes back to the, from a utilitarian, utilitarian standpoint, absolutely, right? Sacrifice that one person. But if you get more deontological, not so much. Yeah, I'm not a fan of utilitarianism. It's uh, it's it's a useful it's a useful tool to have in the ethical arsenal, but uh, it doesn't get us all the way there. Well, for econ, <laughs> right? But I'll also bring up: in some cases, yours might not be the only threat of torture. Consider the mafia person, and you bring into the room, and you threaten them with all sorts of things, but they know there is an implicit threat against them by the mob that if they do rat on the mob, bad things could happen to them. Maybe bad things could happen to their family. So there's another threat from somewhere else. Does that mean, if you know this, we generally know the mob has this implicit standing threat. Does that mean you have to make a bigger threat? Does the level of threat make a difference? You say, oh, well, just threatening this person's physical safety isn't going to cut it given the other threat against them. So we're going to have to up the ante. We might have to threaten their spouse and children as well. Is that fair game? Or how about threatening think, with them? We're going to let you go and let out the word that you told us. And now your own people are going to be coming after you. I mean, that those are the systems that, that always happen in totalitarian systems as well is is the idea of like you give us some information but then you have this constant fear what happens elsewhere you know it's um like like we as kids i remember we grew up and even if we made jokes about our leader of the government erich honecker in in east germany you know there was sometimes this implicit also talk between children that you know we shouldn't talk tell these jokes because, you know, somebody might be after us. So I didn't never understood why people said that because I never had that feeling coming from my parents in that sense. But there, some kids must have heard something from somewhere that, you know, don't speak up against the government. It's just not the right thing to do. Um, you know, and this was kids. We were children. We were like telling jokes about our government leaders. And perhaps as children, um, it will be overlooked, or perhaps it come back could come back to the parents. Are the children getting these jokes from their parents? Um, our friend Mark O'Brien Lee has a comment for us. Uh, a quote from Mark Lawrence, the Prince of Thorns. Mark has a encyclopedia encyclopedic knowledge of of these uh, types of things. Cowards make the best torturers. Cowards understand fear. And they can use it. Um, and, I, and I think to your point, Sven, that, and, and it also speaks to the utilitarianism, uh, that if we, if we start adopting the tactics 
of the people that we're fighting against, um, the danger is we become those people. We become our enemy. And that even where it's pragmatic to use, you know, to say to flirt with the line, perhaps to cross the line, um, but then there's the intangible damage we do to ourselves and to our culture uh, to become what we're trying not to become. Let me give an actual example of this that ties a little back to my earlier comment. There is that famous, I think, Colombian drug lord in the 90s or 2000s, the one who he had his, his prison, but it's really his compound. I'm forgetting his name. I don't know if anyone remembers who this was. Um, big drug lord was effectively untouchable. And eventually the government with U.S. support said, we're going to, to get this guy. And now he was killing police and judges and everyone was at risk. The police would actually go out wearing masks because they did not want to be seen. And eventually it became effectively a nationwide manhunt. But as they were doing this, they took this drug lord's family and they put them up in a hotel that was kind of police headquarters. They said, oh, we're doing it for their safety. My guess was it was less about their safety because I don't think the average citizens were really threatening this drug lord's family. And it was either implied, hey, we have your family, just saying, or perhaps it was a form of human shields. This is our police headquarters. Yes, you can come in here and start shooting, blowing it up, but who knows who's going to get hurt in the crossfire. And so there was the implied threat against their family that was more than just saying in my earlier example, hey, here's what we could do. We might go after your family. They physically took the family, said you're here. Now they weren't hurting them. They weren't chaining them to a radiator. We're just saying they're going to stay here in a nice, comfortable room. But of course, a prison is a prison, no matter how comfortable it may be. Did they cross a line, as you pointed out a moment ago? Did they become their enemy by by doing this? Or was it just flirting with the line? If you did that, if you, if you took the family, if that was you that took his family and put him up someplace, basic fundamental question, could you sleep at night? You know, that, that's an interesting uh, point because you know, th that, that line comes up from time to time and you have to be able to sleep at night. Uh, and I think that that's very effective for those of us that struggle to make our decisions based upon a clearly and a well-calibrated moral compass. I think there are plenty of people who sleep just fine at night, no matter what they do which means we keep going around and around. But uh, you know, Even, I think, I think um, this is one of those topics where uh, the best we can do is try, to, is try to look at the angles because trying to get to a clear definition, it's so murky. It's so complex. There's so many variables and so many unknowns that um, we just have to keep grappling with the gray in this one. Uh, so, Can I ask uh, you just one last question? Of course. What if there was no violence involved? Violence meaning that, you know, you didn't physically hurt them. You didn't do anything emotionally violent to harm them. Because it's, it's, cause I know you want to rap, but to me, and it's this gray area thing again, you know, What's the line? What's the line? I mean, again, the four of us are sitting here and it's a nice sanitized environment. But if you're in a position where you have to make a decision, what's your moral code going to be? You just going to let them sit there? Oh, I can't interrogate them because that could be torture. So what's your moral code going to be? And this That's is real stuff that, that police officers go up go through every day. Yeah, and I'm not sure anybody can really know that until they're in that situation. You know, so you're right. Sitting here comfortably talking about it on Zoom, uh, you know, we can try to put ourselves in that kind of situation. 
But of course, one of the benefits of these conversations is then, you know, occasionally we do get into these kinds of situations, maybe not this one, uh, but at least having discussed it, we may be better equipped to handle it when difficult situations arise. So, uh, so thank you all for uh, difficult and uh, interesting conversation. Mark Hirschberg, Sven Lauch, Stuart Wiggins, appreciate your time, your thought, uh, your observations. Um, for those of you who are watching and listening, if you have a topic you would like us to take up, please go to my website, ethicsninja.com. Use the contact information. If it's a compelling topic, we'll use it for a future episode. And um, we're going to stick around after we stop st streaming and stop screaming uh, to uh, chat a little longer. If premium members have access to uh, those backstage conversations. Uh, but either way, encourage you to continue grappling with the gray.